came out from an alligator farm down yeah. there. You never know what you're going to find down there. Um, There's gators down there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Got to be careful. Gotta watch out. <laughs> so um, it was it was uh, it had a nice little nursery going on, and then that spillway went right into the river, and then they had plants all throughout. So um, I mean, just even. Even we've got the zebra mussel problem, but even plants can be a problem. And lots of times they're they're even more silent because lots of the growth that happens is happening so low you don't really know there's a problem until they top out and then and then wreak havoc. So all right, well, bye. <laughs> yeah, you can walk across I assume you can water on us in Florida. Oh yeah, one fact I loved is one acre of water hyacinth has about 200, 200 tons of force or weight. So if you've got all of that moving down a water system and it you know, comes in contact with a structure, it could cause some damage. That's a lot of weight. Any uh, questions on plants? Oh, well, last year we had enough time to go out and collect plants and we only have to look at them, but not much growing there. I have a question. How's the milfoil local, the native, differ from the invasive? Oh, that was the slide that was missing. I don't know where it went. It has um, the leaflet pair. So there's there's four, if you remember the picture. Um, the leaflet for the Eurasian water milfoil, usually 14 and up. And for the native milfoil, it's, what, 12 and, and under. Yeah. Um, the rootstock <laughs> on the Eurasian water milfoil has more. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's the easy one. When you pull it out of the water, the native milfoil stays rigid and the Eurasian folds up on itself. So you can see it has this beautiful structure to it in the water. You pull it out and it's just, it's just a straight piece. It's got more of a reddish tint on it. Um, yeah, but well, there's also that. A lot of people that. have paws. If, you, if you're not like sure what it is, can you bring it in for identification? Mm -hmm. I think for that one, it's so hard. Extension, kind of shallow, so it really oh. help. I mean, we're going to stay. Wood is kind of warm, dry. Yeah. Hand off and you hand off this. But what if it's a crossbreed? Didn't you? They sent it for genetic case. testing. Yeah. 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 And that new population we found in Hagerman, we had to send it off to, uh, to Michigan to get genetics on it. Just because we weren't quite, we were pretty sure it was Eurasian, but we hadn't seen it up that far. And it was going to end up being a few thousand dollar deal so we wanted to make sure mm -hmm. and so we sent it off to, to get genetics and it was so that is one easy way you can tell the difference no I would not say it was easy I definitely couldn't do it. genetics on that so there's guys out there that can um, I saw it in the water it almost seemed like it didn't branch out as much as the milfoil but yeah. that could have been low it could have been lower to the ground a lot of the Eurasian water milfoil plants that I've seen, they want to tower to the surface because of sunlight. For the native milfoil, it's more like covering the bottom. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's just a local characteristic or not, but it seems like a trend to me. Um, the hybrid milfoils that we're seeing up in northern Idaho are becoming so tricky to tell apart that you have to send them off to genetics. And they're like, oh, this is somewhere in between. So So that was all the uh, aquatic plant stuff we got, but we can cover some more of that if need be. So then we'll talk about each kind of area of our programs. And we were talking earlier about the prevention side of it. And this is where we come into our boat inspection stations. So last year we had 15 boat inspection stations, once again, primarily located at the borders. The artillery is going into the state. We did just under 50,000 inspections. This was a pretty high number compared to in the past. And we did just under 700 hot washes. This is quite a bit higher than in the past. So we're, we're finding more stuff. Um, 245 boats were found coming through the check stations with, with weed on them. And that was just a checkbox that we put in the data unit to have those inspectors notating that. Um, out of all those inspections, we find 15 muscle fouled boats, three of which were touring kayaks going to Montana. And so you might see, man, that's a lot of inspections for this many boats, um, but 15 is uh, pretty good. Three of those boats were key because they were kayaks, 
and therefore you reinforce that need for the non-motorized youth group um, coming forward and being an advocate for, for the program. Um, those boats were down in Lake Mead, and it was, uh, they were going up on the beach, and then it was their foot traffic, actually, that was dragging muscles in. So it wasn't muscles attached, they were dragging them into the boat, and then there was muscles and shells in the boat, and then when they came through the check station, that's how we found them. We have seen muscles attached to the bottoms, but those are generally the ones that are down in Lake Mead all the time. Um, and then as far as the program as a whole, 121 muscles found muscle boats since we first started in 2009. So out of those boats, let's break them up. So we have 40% from Lake Mead, or 40% from the Great Lakes, and that's just collectively. So we took that whole area and lumped them into the Great Lakes. See, Lake Mead, Havasu, and Lake Pleasant and Powell are, uh, are the stronger portions. And that becomes more obvious when you're dealing with live mussels versus dead mussels. When you have a, a boat from the Great Lakes, generally by the time it gets over here, the mussels are going to be dead. You can have a much better chance of getting some fresh live mussels if you pull the boat out of Lake Mead or Powell or Pleasant, Havasu. So this is a map that most folks like to see. This is just one of our check stations, our busiest check stations up in northern Idaho up in Cedars, that's on I-90. It gets a lot of that Post Falls, Coeur d'Alene, Spokane interaction there. But you can see all the states and several provinces up in Canada are, uh, are represented there. So boats move around, people move around, and people love taking their boat with them to come to Idaho or through Idaho to recreate. Whether they're going to Oregon, Washington, or Montana, they're coming through Idaho and they're probably coming to Idaho and stop and go and recreate, so things are moving around. And you can, you can apply this to any other invasive species or any species in general, because if we have terrestrial noxious weeds that are on an ATV, I imagine that you can make this same map stop ATV users at the border, ask them where they've been, ask them where they're going, let them go, hot wash their ATV, and you would see the same type of schematic, maybe even more. Um, People like to take their stuff with them when they travel. This map is from uh, I-15 at Malad. This is the interstate coming from uh, from Salt Lake up north. We catch a catch, catch a fair bit of foul boats out of uh, Malad. They caught a boat um, last night or the, the night before um, that was coming up through Malad. And you can see a lot of interaction between Lake Powell, Lake Havasu, and like me coming up through the lab. And you can you can also see that that threat between the Wasatch Front and Salt Lake and the southeast corner of the state. And with Deer Creek Reservoir coming online with they found some villagers. Deer Creek is right outside of, of um, Park City. It's on the Provo River, I believe. And they found some villagers in the, in one of their detection nets. So that coming online is a big threat to that corner of the state because we have the data to show there's a lot of interaction between that same consumer base down in Salt Lake and Fair Lake. So that's where they were at. This is where they're going. So when they go through the check station, you can see that real shocking effect, and they go just about anywhere. You can really tell that because it's on a freeway. So we got a lot of folks coming through Malad that our snowbirds going to Canada. We caught on to this trend several years back where we first started the inspection stations just after Memorial Day or just before 4th of July. And we're like, well, we're catching the bulk of the boat users. Wrong. We were missing the bulk of the snowbirders. And those folks are coming from Mead and Havasu and Pleasant, taking their boat with them and going back to Canada. We were missing a big threat there. And with the data, we were able to identify that threat and then change our hours operation there. And you can see that shocking effect with Malad, and they're going to Canada, and they're going to Montana and Washington. So. Okay, we also survey. This is while I was kind of hitting that with Deer Creek. And so they're doing the, kind of the same type of survey program as that we are. This is one of the things that we do during the summertime when we're in that muscle villager spawning. Um, this is a 64 micron mesh net. Lower this down in the water column, bring it back up, and then you collect your sample in the bottom. You then put that sample into a container, send it off to the lab, and they analyze it. It's a third party lab. 
and they tell us what's in our sample, whether there's muscles in it or not. And um, to this day, out of all our monitoring, we don't have muscles yet in our, in our nets. And we do a fair bit of sampling. Um, we sample every major water body, depending on the recreation type, hydropower, irrigation, how many boat launches it has, how much use it has. We put that into a matrix and it tells us hey, a lake is important and we need to monitor it. And it is one of the more important ones. There's several on the Snake River that are important, critical water bodies. Um, obviously, Coeur d'Alene, Priest Lake, um, Pond Ray, those are all critical water bodies. And we go out and survey them. And we take a tow several times throughout that spawning season, every two weeks. Take several samples per water body, depending on the size. And we send those off to a lab. 670 plankton tow samples were taken last year out of 67 water bodies. You can see they're scattered throughout the state. Um, I cover everywhere from Riggins down to Nevada and then over to Burling. It's kind of my chunk. Um, to this state, we still have no dracinid muscle as far as villagers or a substrate detected. Um, we also are getting assistance from Idaho Power and other counties that are coming on board and saying, you know, instead of you guys driving all the way over here, why don't we just take the samples for you and then we'll package them off and send them to the lab. And that's worked out quite nicely. So you can also see the, the green triangles there. Those are substrate samplers. And that's the same idea of using a pipe. And so we take a pipe without muscles, just the blank PVC and ABS pipe, lower it down to the water column, it gives them a substrate, and then they can attach there, and then every so often those folks are out there taking the substrates out and then visually inspecting them for muscles. So that's the other way that we're doing our monitoring. The third arm, the education side of it. So big education side is at our check stations themselves. Those folks are out inspecting the boats and they kind of gather clues on whether it's high risk or low risk and how to inspect a boat properly, how to hot wash a boat, but they're also giving them a pamphlet, giving them a little brown book, if they're interested, giving them a brochure, something in their hand to tell them why we are doing what we're doing. So, so um, minimum temperature to be effective for hot water? Yeah. So with our machines, we run 140 degrees mm -hmm. for 10 seconds constant time. And Coming from the research that's been done, that's just as affecting as a chlorine bleach print. <coughs> and so if they don't like hot water, if you hit them with that 140 degrees, the high pressure is meant to blast them off, and then you lower the pressure down and you cook them. And that 140 for 10 seconds, yeah, it turns them into you. The shell's still there, but if you pop open the inside, all the, all the inside are when we treat ballast tanks and live wells, we'll turn that heat down, say like 110, just due to like the rubber grommets and the components in the boat. We'll turn that heat down, and then we just extend it out to five or 10 minutes, depending on which system we're looking at. So there's kind of different ways to do it, but that's the way that we do it. So there's and what uh, are you doing with the, when you're collecting the water then? After you treat boats, do you have it in the tank? And it's treated and all of our it's treated with hot water and all of our check stations are set up in an area that we can dump that water out in like a gravel yard or like on a concrete pad. And it's that's another key thing is when you're doing this at your house, you want to make sure to wash your boat in an area that's not draining to the river. Yeah. You know, I, I can understand that's just kind of where you are at a boat ramp going yeah. to the water. <laughs> so you can, you can imagine that check station at Redfish were set up where they come around the corner and where they get boat inspected for invasive species and they get boat inspected from Lana for boat safety and then they come around and back in. We can't do our hot washes there. The grade falls right into the lake. And so then we make them go around, go up the hill where it goes on the other side and it's just a dirt gravel yard and we hot wash there. And yeah, I can understand here. I, I'm not sure yeah. that you would make it that <laughs> issue. I was just kind of curious. A lot of these check stations are just out in the desert, like Highway 93. So there's out there. You know, 
but actually it's, it's not going to go anywhere. Um, I'm not sure how Tom does check stations up in Northern Idaho. I haven't seen any of them. But I'm sure they're set up in some sort of a concrete pattern. So what's your, in the state, what's the workforce? How many permanent, how many contemporary employees? Yeah. You do all of this stuff. You must have, must be pretty significant. Not as much as you think, I'll think. Um, so, so the two of you plus one person east yeah, of Burley? We <laughs> have, yeah. We have, Beth and I are based out of the Boise office along with our GIS specialist, um, Stephen Cox, and then our section manager, Matt Boyle, out of the Boise office. And then a, a noxious weed guy, Dan Safford, he helps out quite a bit too. So there's five of us out of the Boise office. There's one in Idaho Falls, and there's one in Coeur Those are the permanent staff. We fund this, the funding comes through, and then we push it out the door, and most of those are going to a cooperator, a local cooperator. And so a local conservation district, um, and they're going to employ their own seasonal staff to run the check station. Yeah. Yeah. And so at any given time, you know, between our check stations, on average there's six to eight inspectors per check stations. And so you're you're talking some folks there, but most of those are, are seasonal. We also do invasive species workshops. We do talks like this. CWA are coming online in their cooperation. State, federal, local groups, boat shops, marinas, boating events, stuff like that, like the Burley Boat Regatta, the jet boat races up in Riggins, that kind of stuff. Pet shops, garden centers, horticulture shows. We're trying different avenues in which to get this message out. Here's just some. Uh, some good pictures. We got New Zealand mud snail up in the top, Asian carp in the middle, um, and then you've got Bellagers, Didymo. This is actually down in New Zealand, and those two pictures on this far left are kind of it's kind of a funny story where New Zealand gave us New Zealand mud snail, and in turn we give them Didymo. They're pretty worked up about Didymo. Rocks not pretty common around here, but it's a common. They can come up to nuisance levels, but yeah, they're pretty fired up about that. And then salt sea are on the bottom. So what's the mud one? What, are that guy with the mud? That's the dinner. That's the dinner. It's like an owl. You know when you're out wading around fly fishing in the stream and uh -huh. you get that rock snot stuck to all the rocks? That's dinner. And there's several uh, different species of dinner. It's just a class and a group and yeah, rock snot is just kind of horrible. That's a good descriptor though. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah, that, I believe that's a And what's the plant again on the right? That is um, tamarisk. tamarisk, salt cedar. We have it down in southwest Idaho. Have you guys ever seen the Asian carp in action? Um, YouTube it. Yeah. It's pretty crazy. <laughs> and you can't email me now. Huh? You can't email me now. You can eat them. Yeah. Somebody should do the industry. Carp and Asian clams. So what, what can we do about all this stuff? The main message is clean, drain, and dry it. And with aquatic stuff, separate from terrestrial noxious weeds, if we clean, then we drain all the compartments out and we allow it enough time to dry it out for aquatics, this makes our risk and the viability of the organism go way, way down. Um, depending on the species can depend on how hard you gotta clean it. And Drain it out pretty much the same, but how long are you gonna let it dry out? With quagga mussels and the way our statute's set up, we have the ability to hold them for up to 30 days because the research has shown that depending on the environmental conditions that's going on outside, like right now it's pretty overcast and rainy, they can survive on the water for up to 30 days. They would do just fine. So that's where we set our 30 day standard at. If it's say in July and August and it's 105, 110 outside, at when it's going to get short and quite down, maybe even three to five days. Um, but we'll still hold that 30 day standard unless we have reason to, leave to, to go down. So we inspect and clean off any viable plants, animals, and mud. We pull the plug or you use a bailer sponge or a bucket to, to get all that water out, and then you just allow it to dry out. Okay, here's the map we were talking about. So, what we're doing for 2015. 